No. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like you, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation and chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 12 uh, to the end of the chapter. Revelation 1, verse 12, down to the end of the chapter. And it begins in this way. It says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in thy my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. And again, God will bless the reading of his precious word to us as we contemplate it together today. So as we begin this study, we are going to be reminded that John hears this voice and he turns to uh, to see the voice. And we saw in verse 12, he saw seven golden lampstands. And uh, again, the idea was that the Lord wanted him to get to to see these lampstands. He wanted them to uh, to to grip him the importance and significance of these lampstands, which we're going to see is a representative of the local churches. And we need to realize the importance of it. Perhaps even as we proceed in the study today, we'll see how important it is to the mind of God, these these lampstands, these testimonies uh, that are established in the darkness for the glory of the Lord Jesus. But notice uh, verse 13, it says, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. And I want to just think again about this phrase. We've we've highlighted it in the past. We'll do it again uh, in the midst. Uh, it just seems that in the word of God, God would always have his son be in the midst. He wants him to be in that central place. And so he's in the midst. And, and the idea is this, that, that all of these lampstands, in a sense, uh, what makes them special is that Christ is in the midst. <laughs> He's their gathering center. He's their unifying force. And how often we find this in scripture. Uh, he hangs on the center cross in John 19 and verse 18. Uh, he, he's surrounded, as we know, by two thieves, but he is the one on the center cross. He's seen in Psalm 22, in the midst of his enemies, surrounded by the bulls of Bashans and these wild beasts. And again, where is he? He's in the midst in Psalm 22, verses 12 and 16. Uh, we have the promise, don't we, in Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered in his name. There he is in the midst, Matthew 18, 20. And in resurrection, the Lord Jesus would often appear amongst his disciples in the midst of them. And just one example from John's writings, John chapter 20, a lovely verse, uh, the gospel of John chapter 20 and verse 26, where we read this. They're in the room and it tells us about their condition. It says, and after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. And here in the book of Revelation, 
once more we see him in the midst we see him in the midst of the seven golden lampstands in revelation 5 and verse 6 it says and i beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of god sent forth into all the earth revelation 7 and verse 17 again we read for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters and god shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and so it's it's a good thing to be reminded of are we are we glad and content to have the lord in the midst uh we, so often um our uh, furniture uh, is a reflection of our theology and we've we've talked about this before that uh, the catholic church the centerpiece is an altar because they're still sacrificing christ they don't believe that it's finished it's an ongoing unbloody sacrifice they have the sacrifice of the mass but but that altar is the centerpiece of their churches uh, the protestant reformation used to have these massively high pulpits and uh, you'd almost get a nosebleed climbing up there to to speak and the idea is that we're elevating the word of god right the, this has been lost by tradition and by the traditions of men and so we're elevating the word of god and then when there was a revival of new testament christianity there was a simple table with a loaf and a cup and the chairs were gathered around and the picture was our theology we, what we believe is that christ is the gathering center the one who is in the midst of the church and so he the one in the midst and then we get a description and it's a rare thing in the word of god to have any physical description of the lord jesus we can pick up little bits we know that they plucked out the hair from his beard so we know he had a beard we know that he was clearly jewish because the woman of samaria recognized from his features uh, how is it that you, being a Jew, would have dealings with me, a Samaritan woman? But beyond that, we really do not know a whole lot about what the Lord looked like. And we only get, as it were, a couple of occasions in the Word of God where we get any kind of description. And it's not what we would normally think, these descriptions. One of them is in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 which we've all already referred to and see quite uh, very much as a parallel to this uh, passage here, uh, Daniel 7 and verse 13, where we read, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. And uh, again, not a, a, a lot of description, but he comes to the Ancient of Days. Uh, and it's interesting how the Ancient of Days, there's there's kind of a description uh, of, of him as well. Um, uh, again, just this idea of the, the white hair and all the rest of it. But uh, basically, that's one place. And then the other place is here and uh, in, in Revelation uh, chapter 1. Now, in, in the passage in Revelation chapter 1, I want you to notice that he's called one like unto the Son of Man. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man. Now, this title, Son of Man, we, we, we saw it in chapter 7, verse 13, uh, one like unto the Son of Man. So what is the significance of that phrase, Son of Man? as opposed to the phrase son of God. Well, one thing we know is that the phrase son of man is connected in scripture with judgment. And I want you to look at John's gospel, chapter five, which is very fitting because we've said that Revelation really is a book about judgment. He starts by judging the churches. He's gonna go on and judge Israel and the nations. Uh, so, and then he's gonna judge the whole of humanity. It's a book of judgment. And in John 5 and verse 27, we read this, and he gave him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Okay, so he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Now, what does that phrase son of man mean? Son of Adam, that's the idea, son of Adam. 
And uh, one of the things about Christ is that we know that he is verily God. There's no question in our minds about that. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Uh, he eternally existed as God, uh, the son. And yet in his humanity, he took on the additional nature of humanity. He became a man. And why? What's the significance of that? Well, part of it is uh, that it, it makes him so suitable to judge. Because people can't say, well, it's okay for you judging us. You know, you're up there in heaven. You have no idea what it is to live down here on this fallen world. What? How could you possibly judge us? And the Lord Jesus can say, well, actually, I do know what it is to live down there in that fallen world. I was there. I was alive there. I was crucified there. And so uh, in his humanity, he's, he's a very suitable judge. But he's also and not only man but he's fully god again in john 5 uh, and another term used in verse 25 for as the father hath life um sorry verse 25 verily verily i say unto you the hour is come and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the son of god and they that hear shall live uh, so not only is he the son of adam he's also the eternal son who lived in the bosom of the father. He's the son of God. And of course, the son of God term there is in connection with re rising people to life. Uh, they're going to hear his voice and he's going to call them from the graves. But the son of man is specifically to do with judgment and how fitting in this vision, because he's about to uh, assess the churches. He's about to come uh, to them uh, in judgment and, and point out what is lacking in these churches. And uh, throughout the book, he's going to be in that capacity as judge. Notice, too, uh, that the Son of Man is clothed with a garment down to the foot. And the only other description of people clothed with garments down to the feet is descriptions of the high priest. His garment went down to the feet. And so we, we see something of the Lord Jesus here in his capacity as our great high priest as well. And... Um, that's the picture that is to be conveyed. He's acting as as the the high priest of his people here. Uh, he also has a girdle around the breast made of gold. Uh, it's interesting too that the very phrase breasts here um, uh, is uh, the two distinct words for breast in scripture. Uh, one is is masculine, speaking of a man's chest. The other is feminine uh, and speaks of a woman. And actually, the phrase that's used here is female. Uh, it's the woman's breast. And so what does that convey? And remember, there's a lot of symbolism here. What is it con conveying? Well, the idea conveyed is that of affection and tenderness. Do you remember when Paul said that when they were with the Thessalonians, he said that they were like a nursing mother unto them? And the idea is that tenderness and affection. Let me just read that scripture, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7, where we see uh, this idea of the nursing mother used in terms of the affectionate care that was shown by the apostles uh, to the Thessalonians. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse, and the idea there is a nursing mother cherisheth her children and so we see something of the lord's affections here uh, uh he loves the church we know that he has great affection for it but but wh whom the lord loves he chastens and he's going to come here and he's he's excising discipline and also uh, th these affections th there's some restraint here because it's clothed about uh with a girdle a golden girdle and so there's some restraint here uh, Affections cannot flow freely in nourishing and cherishing for much which is under the eye of the Son of Man calls for rebuke and discipline. And so we've got to think of this in terms of he's about to uh, rebuke and chasten and discipline some of these churches. So the affections are kind of held back a little bit uh, because of this strange work. Judgment is always God's strange work. Verse 14, it says his head and his hairs were white like wool as white as snow and his eyes were as a flame of fire so his his head and his hairs were white like wool as white as snow and the the, the point of this is this 
that he has the wisdom and maturity to judge wisely. He's about to pronounce judgments, but they're made in perfect wisdom. He, he knows all the facts. He knows how to use all the facts. Uh, he, he's the one who is the all wise. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And again, this idea of, of penetrating and judging uh, in perfect holiness. Uh, fire often speaks of the holiness of God and his eyes uh, are looking and judging and penetrating in perfect holiness uh, speaks of penetrating discernment nothing in the innermost depths of the human heart can escape the scrutiny of those eyes and it would would be good for us if we could keep in mind that that uh, those eyes are always watching uh, it might help us to be more conscious of staying holy, living a holy life when we think of the, the penetrating holiness. Amazing how the eyes of the Lord Jesus, when, when he came out of Pilate's judgment hall and Peter, you remember, had denied the Lord with oaths and cursings, the Lord just looked at Peter and it tells us that Peter wept bitterly. And we, it's good to remind ourselves well, there's a day coming when every one of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to look into those eyes. And I'm not sure the Lord will have to say a whole lot. Just that penetrating gaze will leave us uh, conscious of everything that has been done in the flesh that needs burning up. And so, again, we think of this picture of judgment, and, and here he is with these eyes like a flame of fire. And then his feet like unto fine brass, verse 15, uh, as if they burned in a furnace. So burning hot brass, molten brass. Uh, his voice is the sound of many waters. Uh, the brazen uh, or brass or the brazen altar speaks of judgment of sin. Uh, that's where offerings were offered and he will return to judge sin. Uh, he's a consuming fire. Uh, wherever he walks in the midst, everything is tested. Will it survive the fire? Or is it all going to be wood, hay, and stubble that will be consumed in an instant by the, the fire of those brazen feet? A similar kind of vision is given in Ezekiel chapter 1. We won't take the time of looking there, but when this, uh, this glory chariot, and it talks about the four living creatures, and it talks about their feet, like burning brass and the idea is again god is about to come in judgment to israel and here in the context he's about to begin judgment with the church why because judgment must first begin where at the house of god it says his voice is the sound of many waters it's amazing if you ever have visited niagara falls and the sheer noise of that volume of water as it comes down over that precipice is quite remarkable. And, and so his voice is like the sound of many waters. And again, there's a, an Old Testament reference here to this in Psalm 93 and verse 4, where we read this, The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. And of course, uh, again, we see here the Lord on high, and he has the voice like the voice of many waters. And we, we think of the power of many waters. Well, it's a very powerful thing, uh, the power of Niagara as the water comes over. And so the idea is this, that the voice of the Lord Jesus is incredibly powerful. This is the voice that spoke the worlds into existence. This is the voice that called Lazarus from the grave. This is the voice that the day comes that all that are in the graves will hear his voice. Uh, he's going to summon the dead from all the graves. Such power, incredible power in this voice. He says, it's like the sound of many waters. And then it says, verse 16, he had in his right hand. Now, the right hand is usually a symbol of strength. You, you know, usually most people are right-handed and their strongest arm and, and hand is their right hand because it's one that gets used the most. And so it, there's, there's, again, a symbol of power. And it says he had in his right hand seven stars. And now later on, verse 20, 
Uh, we don't have to struggle with the interpretation of this. What are the seven stars? He says, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, we have to think about who these angels of the seven churches are. But at least for now, let's just think about this, that they're secure in his hands. It's it's a... It's a very secure place, isn't it, to be in his hands? Remember, he said uh, that uh, to, to his own believers, when he's talking to them about security in John chapter 10, nobody will pluck them out of my hand. <laughs> and then they're in the Father's hand, that, that they have doubly gripped. And so it's the idea of that these, these, these angels of the churches, whoever they are, are very secure because he has them in his right hand. So we've got to figure out a little bit about who they are. And some suggestions, some people have thought, well, maybe each church has a guardian angel. Uh, that's one suggestion. Uh, I don't think it's a good suggestion, but it's a suggestion that is made. Another suggestion is that these seven stars are the representatives of the seven churches who are going to carry the message to the seven churches, the implication being that John's on the Isle of Patmos, and these seven messages, because the word angel, um, the literal translation of angelos is messenger. Okay, that's what it means. So, so these seven messengers, one from each of the seven churches, is going to come to Patmos and receive from John the letter and then carry that letter and read it and present it to each individual assembly. So how does that fit with, with Scripture, even using this picture of stars as messengers? And perhaps another way we could think of it is maybe, they're, maybe these messengers are, are, are teachers uh, that are going to bring this message to the churches. Uh, why do I say that? Just a couple of references that would link stars with instruction and teaching. Uh, look at Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 12, and verse 3. Daniel, chapter 12, and verse 3. It says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So many that turn many, and how do you turn people to righteousness? Well, usually it's through preaching the word of God, isn't it? Preaching the word of God is what turns people to righteousness. And so perhaps the idea is uh, that these messengers, maybe they're part of the oversight of a local assembly, maybe even teaching elders, they're going to come and receive the message, they're going to go back and deliver the message to the seven churches. Another reference, again, to the stars being referred to uh, in a teaching capacity is the little epistle of Jude just before Revelation. And in this context, it's used of false teachers, but it's still used of stars. Jude 13, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. And then it says this, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, they're teachers, <laughs> but they're false teachers, and they're called wandering stars because they're wandering away from the truth, and they're leading others away from the truth, and a very uh, serious consequence awaits them. So just a, just a suggestion. Now, maybe not everybody will agree with me, but uh, the idea is that these are messengers to the churches, perhaps the ones that are coming to receive the letter, will then go and deliver the letter, uh, maybe oversight of an assembly, maybe people who have some ability and communicate in the work as an elder to be apt to teach, right? So that would fit with that. And so these are secure in his right hand, despite persecution. The message will get delivered because the messengers are in his hand and nobody will be able to touch them until they have delivered the message that God has given them. They're safe, they're secure. And so he has in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth, 
when a sharp two-edged sword of course we're very familiar with this two-edged sword again lots of symbolism but the symbolism is usually explained elsewhere in scripture and we know this from the epistle to the hebrews that the word of god is that sharp two-edged sword yep to 4 verse 12 of hebrews for the word of god is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart and what else would you expect to come out of the mouth of the son of man who is the word of god remember we're going to see that revelation 19 on his thigh is written uh, the word of god uh, john tells us in the beginning is the word the word was with god the word was god the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us so he is the the living real word of god and out of his mouth what is going to come out of the mouth of the one who is the word of god well the word of god is going to come out of his mouth interestingly enough this sword the one in hebrews 4:12 again don't want to be overly technical but it's a short sword described uh, like a dagger it's a short sword that's described but the one here in the hands of the son of man is a huge five foot long dangerous in battle or what would like a cutlass uh, it's a huge uh, sword and again we just think of uh, being under the ministry of the word of god sometimes when when we're under the ministry of the word of god we feel the prod don't we uh, we feel like that that hurt uh, it, it hit home and uh, again uh, imagine the word of god in the mouth of the one who is the eternal word saying something to the churches would that hurt would that wince if he has something to say to them it really would cut to the quick wouldn't it the son of man assessing them can you imagine we're going to get to ephesus this church that seems so orthodox and then the lord himself saying i've got something against you that would feel very painful uh, to feel that sword cut and wince as the truth hits home but we're thankful for it we need that sword to do its work in our lives we need to feel the uh, the prod of the sword convicting us and uh, bringing us to repentance and usefulness and change it's able to discern between soul and spirit we find that difficult but the word of god is able to do that notice to his countenance he talks about his countenance uh, again verse 16 was as the sun shineth in his strength back in the book of acts chapter 26 as paul gives his testimony for the third time well the first time i guess we get god's account of his conversion and then he gives it on two further occasions but it's interesting that in each occasion he talks about the brightness of what he saw that day and in each occasion it seems like it gets brighter and brighter and brighter And we get to chapter 26 verse 13 he says at midday o king i saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining around about me and them which journeyed with me now remember this is at midday in the middle east so it's when the sun is at its zenith and yet he saw a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun and so we're, we're thinking of this vision that john sees is a vision of a glorified christ he had prayed father glorify me with the glory that i had with thee before the world was and i believe that the lord answered that prayer in his ascension the lord jesus was glorified with the glory he had with the lord from before the foundation of the earth and when he is seen post ascension he always appears in glory so when he appears to Saul on the Damascus road, remember, he's a glorified, risen Christ in his ascended glory. And all is blinded by the brilliance of the glory that emanates from the Son of God. And we're going to see John is going to have a similar response. But he's the, remember the Lord Jesus, he is 
the son of righteousness, <laughs> S-U-N, of righteousness, Malachi 4 and verse 2. He's the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. And so here we, we get this picture of the Lord Jesus in his appearing to John on Patmos. And he, he is, uh, his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So what is the result of this vision? Well, look at John's response. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. What's so significant is that this is John. This is the one that enjoyed such intimacy with the Lord Jesus that we read that in that upper room, he, as it were, laid his head on the bosom of the Savior. I mean, nobody on earth got closer, <laughs> humanly speaking, to John and enjoyed deep intimacy with the Savior. And yet now he sees, uh, remember when he did that, the, the glory was veiled, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity was veiled. But now John sees the same person, but he sees him in his unveiled glory. And what happened? He fell on his face as dead. It's interesting, isn't it? When men come into the presence of the glory of God, it doesn't matter who they are, how big they think they are, they all have the same response. Saul of Tarsus saw him on the Damascus road and he fell on his face like a dead man. Uh, John sees him, he falls on his face as dead. Isaiah sees him, this great prophet who's pronounced woe on the nation. And then as soon as he comes into the presence of the glory, he says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the people, the midst of a people of unclean lips. And I wonder if we lost this. I wonder if we lost the sight of the glory of the Son of God. So often he's presented in this way of uh, almost like some kind of buddy. Now, yes, it's true what a friend we have in Jesus. But this same Jesus is now gloried, glorified. And, and again, I, I can imagine that if the Lord would truly manifest himself in our assemblies, in all of his resplendent glory, every one of us, don't care who we are, we'd, we'd all be on our faces. We'd all hit the dust in his presence. Such is the glory of the Son of God. And oh, how wonderful it is to be able to uh, speak of his glory uh, and what a glorious Savior he is. I fell at his feet as dead. But isn't it nice how kind he is? Remember, we talked about his affections, his tenderness. It says, I fell at his feet as dead and he laid his right hand upon me. This, this symbol of strength, <laughs> right hand, but he laid it upon me, saying unto me, fear not. And then affirming who he is. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And what, what a, a amazing confirmation who he is. He's the eternal one, the first and the last. He was the one there at the very beginning. He'll be the one at the very end. He's he's the eternal one, the first and the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega. We've already thought about that. And not only is he the first and the last, he's the one that was alive, uh, that lived, that liveth, he that liveth, but was dead, <laughs> that he really did die. He really did take on humanity and he really did die but he's alive now. He's a living Savior. I serve a risen Savior. He's living. He's alive. Jesus is alive and living and real. And he, he says, I am alive forevermore. He lives in the power of an endless life. He will never, ever face death again. He faced it and he conquered it. He says, I am alive for him. Amen. He wants you to say amen to this, that he's alive. Do you believe that? He's a living, living savior. He's alive. Amen. And he says, I have the keys of hell and of death. It speaks of his victory over hell and death, man's greatest enemies. He has the keys to those things, which means he has authority 
over these things. He, he's defeated the enemies. By his death, he conquered death. Now, when somebody conquered a city or a fortress, the keys were handed to them, surrendered to them upon their conquest, upon their victory. And Christ has won a great victory over the fortress that has held men captive for generations, death and the fear of dying and hell. He has won the victory and he has the, the keys. The fear of death and the grave has now been vanquished. We don't fear death. We're not very comfortable about the process of dying, <laughs> but we don't fear death because for those of us that have believed in the the, the one who died for us and is risen again, for us, death is the entrance into eternal bliss, right? To, to, to die and be with Christ is far better. In his presence, that's where we'll be, is fullness of joy. And so the fear of death and of hell, we don't have a fear of hell anymore because we know that our destiny, we've passed from death to life. Our destiny is heaven. We're heaven bound. And the Lord is the one who has won that victory for us. So verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen. This is the vision that, that he has faithfully written down. Uh, write the things which thou hast seen. And then the things which are, that's going to be the, the condition of the seven churches. And then the things which shall be hereafter, after the church age has run its course, as we go into, uh, as it were, the, the last day's judgments, things that shall be hereafter. We've already mentioned that it's uh, chapter 4, verse 1 is when that begins. After this I looked, and behold, the door was opened in heaven, and a first voice which I heard was, it was a trumpet talking with me. It said, come up hither, I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. So from chapter 4 onwards, we're looking at things which must be hereafter. And so this is his outline. Write the things which thou hast seen, the vision on Patmos of the glorified Christ, the things which are the state of the seven churches, the things which shall be hereafter from chapter 4. And any, any commentary or teaching on Revelation that ignores the divine outline in verse 19 is going to be wrong. This is the God has written the outline right there to keep us safe. What you've seen, risen, glorified Christ. Things that are the condition in the seven churches, things that shall be hereafter when the church age has run its course, Revelation 4 to 22. So then he goes on and he says this, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in thy right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the churches and the seven lampstands, which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now we've already looked at the seven stars and considered them. We believe that they're messengers, the messengers who will receive this letter uh, that is being written by John will carry it to the seven churches in Asia, each one to its particular church, and will be God's messengers to those churches in delivering the message that they have received. What about the seven lampstands? Well, he said they're the seven churches of Asia. Now, lampstands are designed to give off light in the darkness. That's their purpose in the in the tabernacle, remember, the the only light that was in there, that the rooms were, were dark, but the light in, in the holy place was given by the lampstand, the seven-branched golden lampstand. So its, it's picture is lighting up a dark place. And actually, in, in the holy place, it, it shines on the, 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 th the other items it, it kind of reveals the things of of god and of christ to us that's the idea it's re, it's it's shining on holy things so that they can be seen so when the lord jesus was on the earth he said this i am the light of the world but he's no longer in the world now he says that we're to be the light of the world 
and individually were to shine as lights that people would see our good works and glorify our father in heaven uh, to the Philippians, he talked about them in in the same uh, aspect of shining in the darkness. Let me just read Philippians 2.15. It says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So, so not just individually. We, we need to shine this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, right? Not just individually, but corporately, these seven assemblies in Asia Minor were meant to shine brightly for God in the midst of a dark and wicked world. And of course, how did they do that? Well, they 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 shone on divine things. They 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 they, they illuminate divine things, the things of Christ and uh, who He is and His glory. That's what they're meant to do to to testify to Him in all His beauty and His glory in the midst of the darkness. They're golden. The gold suggests divine character. Remember, the tarmacadam of heaven is gold. Streets are paved with gold. And so, so there should be this heavenly divine character about these assemblies. They exist as a result of divine grace. None of them would exist if it wasn't for the working of divine grace. We're all, uh, every assembly is a result of divine grace. And these lampstands were oil dependent. Without the oil, they would have no benefit at all. And certainly, the church is dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so the idea is this, that in order for us to shine brightly, corporately, as a testimony for the Lord Jesus, everything we do in our local assembly must be done in dependence on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we must depend on his power. We must walk under his control if we're ever going to shine lightly, for, brightly for God. And then concerning these lampstands, they also had a wick. And the wicks needed to be kept clean in order to maintain the lampstand properly. Remember that if oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, well, remember that he is holy. And so anything dirty will hinder his usefulness. And that's why the wicks must be kept trimmed and clean. Each lampstand is individual, standing on its own, we believe in the autonomy of the local assembly, but each assembly looks to the one who is in the midst of the seven lampstands. Each assembly looks to Christ as head in full dependence upon him. And so it's kind of a lovely thing. I, I love the idea of this, that each assembly is both independent and interdependent. Each assembly is responsible to Christ as head, and yet there's a, in the New Testament, there's a lovely uh, kind of cross-pollination and fellowship with preachers from other churches and, and things done together. There's, there's this interdependency as well as independency, but yet there's a looking uh, for each assembly to be looking to Christ who's in their midst as the one who is the head. Yes, we need the fellowship and encouragement of like-minded believers from other assemblies. But, but again, we're not a confederation um, where, where each one is responsible to Christ as head. So the chapter concludes with this vision of the Lord Jesus in all of his resplendent glory. Now, we just have a few minutes left, and I want to just talk a little bit introductory to the seven churches that we'll be considering together. 
as, as fascinating as the book of Revelation is, and we all kind of are interested in the seals and the bowls and the trumpets and all of this kind of stuff, it's very interesting. But one thing that ought to grab our attention is this. What does the Lord Jesus have to say to the church? In fact, we might ask the question, if the Lord Jesus was to write a letter to our assembly, what would he write? <laughs> would it reflect what he wrote to some of these churches? And so as we consider the seven churches, it, it'll be good for us to consider, what, what are you saying to our assembly? You see, one of the refrains, as we know, is he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So, again, just think that the Lord, the one in the midst of the, the churches, he's assessing our assembly. He's looking very closely. What would he say if he was to write to us? Now, why these seven churches? We've already said that there were more churches in Asia Minor than this. In this very vicinity where these seven churches were, there was Colossi, Colossi. Now that got a letter. It got. It actually received a New Testament letter. Uh, until this point, uh, these churches, some of them, at Ephesus did, but some of them didn't. We don't. We don't have a letter to Pergamos apart from this one. Uh, we don't have a letter to Smyrna apart from this one. So, so churches that seemed in New Testament light of things to be even more important because they got a letter from the great apostle Paul are completely ignored in this letter to the seven churches. Why these seven and why only these seven? Well, again, seven, the number of completeness and perfection. And again, suggestion, suggestion I want to make is that perhaps it's a batch sample. These seven are picked because they're a perfect representation of what you might find in the church at any point in time. So at any point in time, you might find a persecuted church. And our brethren in North Korea know what we're talking about here. This is very real to them. They know what it is to experience living in persecution. Uh, the saints in China, the saints in Iran, the saints in, 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 in these Middle Eastern lands, uh, in, in Afghanistan. They know what it is to, to, to experience great suffering for the cause and testimony of the Lord Jesus. They can identify with Smyrna. But there's other churches that we can identify with. There, there's a compromised church. <laughs> we can see that. There's a worldly church. We can see that. Then there's this church that seems to be going through open doors and experiencing tremendous blessing. Uh, we can see all of those things at every, any given point in the history of the church. So what we're suggesting is that th these there are three ways to look at these churches, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at all three ways. First of all, we're going to say, okay, these were letters to seven churches that existed at the time that this letter was written. And they were relevant to them. This, the letter to Smyrna was very relevant to them at that moment in time. And we want to learn what did the Lord have to say to them directly? But also, as we've said, they, they also are representative of what you might find at any given time. And then thirdly, we're going to look at them as prophetic, tracing church history from Pentecost to the apostate church in the first half of the tribulation. Okay? And the reason we're going to do that is because I think we'll see that there's, there's, there's it, it's not difficult to see this, that, that the all-knowing Christ knows history in advance and we see it elsewhere in scripture matthew 13 we have uh the seven kingdom parables that trace the history of the kingdom from the rejection of the king to the point that he is going to be crowned as king of kings and lord of lords what's the king what's, what happens to the kingdom now the king is rejected and so we get this little backbone of scripture seeing the kingdom uh, during uh, the time of his rejection to his coming we see the same thing in leviticus 23 we see the seven feasts of jehovah and it lays out god's dealings with israel uh, from passover all the way to the millennial kingdom from the cross to the crown and it lays out god's dealings with israel prophetically 
And so when we put these things together, we have God's dealings with the kingdom, we have God's dealings with Israel, we have God's dealings with the church laid out beforehand because God knows history in advance. Again, we said that we want to look very specifically at that historical viewpoint, but we also want to look at what would Christ say to our assemblies if he were to address us today. And one thing we could just say off the top of our heads, just a, an immediate statement before we bring our session this morning to a close, is that five out of the seven churches that the Lord Jesus addresses are asked to repent. That's 70%. 70% of the churches that he wrote to are called by the Lord to corporate repentance. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? So what about the churches in the Maritimes? The only two that don't get a call to repentance are Smyrna and Philadelphia. Every other one does. So unless our church is experiencing Smyrna conditions or Philadelphia conditions, maybe there's a need for repentance in our local assemblies and of course the the big note is this it runs through like a refrain in all the churches he that hath an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit saith to the churches maybe as we're listening there might be something addressed in these churches what will call us either individually or corporately to repent of something the lord is showing us but we've got to have ears to hear. And it's interesting. I, I find that there's two ways you can look at scripture. And there are people that I, 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 they're listening. And it's almost like they're sitting in judgment on the word of God as it's being given. They're, they're looking for something they can jump on, something they can criticize or whatever. That's one way you can look at scripture. Another way you can let scripture it do is this. Let it sit in judgment on you. Lord, speak to me from your word that i might hear your voice what what do you see in my life or in my assembly that is displeasing to thee the glorified son of god that i might make adjustments or that we might corporately repent and i think it's much more helpful for us if we come to the scriptures the second way rather than the first allowing the word of god to sit in judgment upon us May God help us as we proceed with this amazing book together. Amen.